God, thank you for today. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And today, Lord, we ask for a special uh, pouring out of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would operate in the spirit, that the spiritual uh, man would understand the things of the spirit and explain the things of the natural. We pray, Lord, for your sound doctrine to sound forth. And Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, we would stand firmly on you, firmly on your teachings, firmly on sound doctrine, and we would manifest the greatest gift that you have given to your believers the gift of unconditional love. Lord, let us love. In Jesus' name, amen. Get our Bibles out and turn them to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we left off last week. If you do not have a Bible, you're going to need one today for sure. Raise your hand, and we're going to bring you a Bible. Does anyone need a Bible? If you don't have one in your hand... You are going to need a Bible today because we're going to read the Bible and the Bible is going to read us and teach us. Anybody else need a Bible at all? Okay, got it? Well, we left off at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, and today we pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. And in between... Last Sunday and this Sunday, a monumental event has taken place in our nation, and we need to address it from a biblical perspective. If you remember in the introduction or the reintroduction, I often introduce a book, the first two chapters, the first two teachings, because um, not everybody can make it every Sunday. So when I reintroduced the book or the letter of 2 Timothy written by Paul to Timothy, who's pastoring a church in Ephesus, a very ungodly city, he warned Timothy, uh, as we're going to see in chapter 3, verse 1, but last week I read chapter 4, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. Do you see that there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3? Paul told Timothy, Timothy, I want you to preach. I want you to teach sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. But let me tell you, I'm just being honest with you. One day, there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. And I don't know if you remember what I said, but I said, people, we are in those times right now. We are in the times when people will not endure sound doctrine doctrine, sound biblical teaching, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the what? The truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And, and that's what we want to do today. And so rather than going through the whole chapter of chapter 3, it's, it's relatively short anyway, 17 verses, we're going to go through the first five verses, and then we're going to look at the sound doctrine concerning same-sex marriage and the associated topic of homosexuality and what the Bible says. So... Um, now that I ever tensed every single person up in this sanctuary, I saw you just went. <laughs> um, I want to show you. We'll begin with sound doctrine, peanuts. <laughs> Boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? It'll never do that in the ninth chapter of Genesis. God promised Noah that it would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. You've taken a great load off of my mind. Sound Theology has a way of doing that. Sound theology has a way of taking a great load off of your mind. I don't know about you, but I have been greatly conster in great consternation since uh, it, many of the decisions by the justice system, but 
uh, most recently, obviously, uh, the Supreme Court's decision on Friday uh, to legalize same-sex marriage in the United States of America. Well, let's look at uh, the Bible for our sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times, that literally means hard to take, troublesome times, will come. For men will be what? Lovers of what? Themselves. Now, let me just stop for a moment. Probably everybody in this room has a personal position on this topic. Probably everybody in this room would attribute some of their understanding of this topic to the Bible. Maybe you think you know what I'm going to say today. Maybe you already know and you've already switched me off. Maybe you struggle with this issue of homosexuality, same-sex marriage, personally. Many of us have people that we love greatly in our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers that we love greatly who struggle with this lifestyle, or don't struggle at all and are completely immersed in this lifestyle. What I'm going to ask you to do is allow the Bible to establish your sound doctrine. I'm going to ask you to let the Bible tell you what the Bible says about this topic, and don't tell the Bible what the Bible says about this topic. Because people who have never read the Bible, they'll tell us what the Bible says about this topic. Or many of us who have never taken the time to do a study on this topic in the Bible, we have a general idea and we summarize and we assume that the Bible says certain things about. And then some of us are like, I don't know. I hear people on the right and on the left, outside the church, inside the church, and I just don't know what to think what to believe, and how and what to say. So I want to fulfill my responsibility as, as your pastor, teacher, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to love people and speak the truth in love. To what people? To love people. What do I want to do today? I want us to help do what? Love people. If you hear anything else, then what you're hearing is not what I'm saying. We want to love people. And we want to speak the what? Truth in what? Love. You've heard me. That's my goal today. That we would be equipped to love people and you and I would be equipped to share the truth in love. So men will be lovers of themselves. King James literally just says they will be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. That's in every generation. Uh, unthankful, unholy. Unloving, but that word unloving there literally means without natural affection. They will be without the natural affection that they were created with. Unforgiving, slanders, without what? Self-control. That is, they won't be able to control their own what? Self. Brutal, and then how, what, would they, what would they think of good? What does the Bible say? They will despise what's good. What we need to make sure is we don't despise them. Oftentimes, they despise us because we despise them. Or you in this, you may be in this sanctuary. And you despise what you've heard, 
you despise the, the jokes, you despise that. Well, that's not the truth. What I want to share with you today is the truth and what is good, and God is good all the time. In all the time, we say God is good. Verse 4, traitors, headstrong, haughty, and what will they also love next? Lovers of pleasure, rather than they will choose in these perilous times, in these hard-to-take, troublesome times, people will choose to love what? Pleasure instead of what? Loving God. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll do what? Deny its power. And, and Paul tells Timothy, you need to uh, turn away from such people. So let's today spend some time looking at uh, the topics in these first five verses. Number one, the Supreme Court justices, and as we prayed beforehand, someone prayed five people, may be able to change what is legal in the United States, but they cannot change the word of God. Five people made this decision. We, we have 300, over 300 million people in the United States of America, five people made this decision against four people who vehemently disagreed with this. They may be able to change what is legal, but they cannot change the word of God. Folks, what is right is right, what is wrong is wrong, and what is sin is sin. But what you have to determine is what are you using to determine what's right, what's wrong, what's sin, and what's not. Well, I would warn you not to use the fickleness of man. We only need to, to look at history and see the abominable things that we have done in man, as mankind. And we made it right. It was legal. And it was the right thing to do. I believe and if we call ourselves Christ followers, then we must choose the Bible to be the determiner of truth. I'm going to share with you a lot of verses today. I have many of them on overheads, but a complete set of my notes are available out on the information desk. You can pick them up so you're not like cramming to write all these down. Look at them, read them along with me, and then you can pick it up, or you can go on the website, and they will be on the website. You could download them. You can send this to your friends, neighbor, whatever, um, or not, if you don't like it. Uh, the Bible is the determiner of truth, okay? How do we know that? Well, because it says so. Jesus saying, he said, sanctify them by your what? Truth. Your what is truth? Your word is truth. So Jesus said, if you and I follow Jesus, if we say we are Jesus followers, Jesus said, what is truth? What did he say? God's word is truth. Okay. Um, the largest chapter in the Bible, uh, Psalm 119, is all about the word of God. And numerous times, and I just picked one. It tells us, you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are what? Truth. Are truth. God's word is truth. And of course, you and I just saying this, the words of Christ, you and I just saying this, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the what? Truth. The truth and the life. What Jesus speaks is truth. So, as Christians, we first choose the word of God to be the determiner of what is right and wrong and what is sin. Secondly, in redefining what is right and wrong and sinful or not sinful, those five people have forsaken their God-ordained responsibility. They were ordained by God for a purpose. And let me share with you 
what that purpose is. According to the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 16, then I commanded your, what? Judges at that time, saying, hear the cases between your brethren and judge, what? Righteously. That means judge with righteousness or judge with what's right. And we have said what determines what's right? The word of God. So those judges are to use the word of God to determine righteousness between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. Those five people have forsaken their God-ordained responsibility to judge righteously. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 to 20. You shall appoint what? Judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with what? Just judgment. You shall not what? Pervert. You shall not pervert justice. Justice is the determination of what's right and what's wrong. And we've said that the word of God is the determiner of what's right and what's wrong. And so according to the Bible, judges must judge justly and they must not pervert justice and say that which is good is bad and that which is bad is good. They must not do that as ordained by God. And those five people have done just that. And later it says, you shall follow what is altogether just that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. I want you to go with me in your Bibles back in the Old Testament to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Okay, if you get to Kings, you've gone a little bit too far, or Samuel, you've gone a little bit too far. If you get to Psalms, uh, keep going. So 2 Chronicles chapter 19, I usually put paper clips in my Bible, um, and because I know where we're going and I get there quicker, but there was, my whole Bible would have been paper clips today. So I got I to gotta get there, um, I got to beat you there. 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 4, Jehoshaphat is now the king of the southern tribes, the king of Judah. And he wants to bring a revival to the nation. In verse 4, it says, So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim. That was the edge of his, of his reign of the southern kingdom. And brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. Then he set what? Judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to the judges, take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for whom? The Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord your God. No partiality, nor taking of bribes. That was the third command, and there are others that we have read today to, that sets and ordains judges what their God-ordained responsibility is for us. These five people have forsaken that ordination and that responsibility. Next, the Bible defines marriage, folks. Not denominations, not religions, not legislatures, not the executive branch and, branch and not the judicial system. The de definition, the definer of what's right, what's wrong, the definer of marriage is the, comes out of the source of truth. You want to know what something is, you go to the source of truth. We've already said that the word of God is truth. We've already said that Jesus Christ is truth. And so let's look at what the word of God says. The definition of marriage is given in the second chapter of the Bible. And it is very clear and concise. And you and I as Christians, we need to know this. It says, therefore, a what? A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his what? Wife, and they shall become one flesh. 
and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The Bible clearly teaches that the unity that God created, the institution of marriage, as he created them male and female, was to consist of one man and one woman. And that one man and that one woman were to come together and they were to become one. Now let's look at the Word of God, speaking of the Word of God, Jesus Christ himself. And, and when they asked him about divorce, he answered and he said to them, Have you not read? See, that's the problem, folks, is most people have not read. They just assume or they tell the Bible what the Bible says. What we need to share with our friends is we need to say, Have you not read? We need to ask them, What do you use to determine truth? And he answered, and he said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them what? Male and female. So there's no, well, it could have been a man, it could have been two men, it could have been, you know, the Bible doesn't say that it has to be. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. In the context of both definitions, these are the clearest, concisest, they're concise, they're other. Having made them male and female, and he said, For this reason, a what? Man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the truth. I am the way, the truth. Speaking the truth and establishing what is truth, what judges should be using to determine what is what? Truth. So the, def the Bible defines marriage. The next topic is the Bible defines homosexuality. And the Bible defines homosexuality as sin. It is sin. We'll begin back in the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. That's what God's word says. Later on in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. In those times, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And so, homosexuality very clearly is established in the Old Testament as sin. As it is in the New Testament, I want you to go forward in your Bibles now to the book of Romans. Paul is writing to the believers in Rome. Just go past the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, book of Acts, and you get to Romans. Rome and its society was a very, very pagan, ungodly, and homosexual promoting culture. And Paul dealt with it, and he taught the church how to deal with it biblically. After speaking of that he's not ashamed of the gospel in chapter 1, verse 16, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Then he goes on, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed. So the word of God reveals the righteousness of God, but now the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the what? Truth. The truth in unrighteousness. The word suppress there, it, it literally means if you take a big beach ball and you try and hold it under the water. How easy is that? It, it's hard, right? And, it, and it's always trying if you don't stay on that thing and you don't apply and you keep, you got to keep pressure. If you don't, what happens? It pops up. You can't stop it. That's, it's a law. And what Paul says here is, this ungodliness and this unrighteousness of men, they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. He's not calling them names. The Bible defines foolishness. Uh, Psalm chapter 14, 
I think it's verse 1, says that a fool says there is no God. And he acts like it. And that's what he's saying. These people are denying God. They, 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 they knew God, but they don't glorify him. They refuse. They suppress the truth of God in, in unrighteousness. So they're foolish in their foolish in their futile thoughts and their foolish hearts. They're darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Professing to be wise. We can change a man to a woman, a woman to man. We are wise. We are almost all powerful. Professing to be wise, they became fools. It's foolish to take what God created as a man, what God created as a woman, and to try and use our skills and abilities to transform them into the opposite. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals, creepy things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their flesh to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who exchanged the what? The truth of God for what? A lie. lie. Folks, it's a lie. We'll get to that. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Folks, even those who believe in evolution have to, following their own rules, it's interesting that many who believe in evolution would support um, this um, uh, lifestyle and choice, But even with the theory of evolution, when there is a mutation or a change that is not beneficial to that species, even evolution says that it will be weeded out in one or two generations. Folks, even nature says that it's not natural. For a man to have sex with a man, for a woman to have sex with a woman, the reason why God created man and woman that way was to procreate. And that's what nature, according to evolution, is intended to do, is to procreate. And any mutation has to be to its benefit, otherwise it deteriorates the species. And the whole idea of um, the, the strong will prevail denies the truth of homosexuality is, uh, is a natural thing and a productive thing. It says in, in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God, they People don't like to retain God. They don't like to retain what God's word says. In their knowledge, God gave them over to debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, don't forget verse 29 and through 32. We're going to talk about it. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, their whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things, underline that, practice such things, are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Not only who do them, but who practice them. In the context of Romans, it's not talking about taking them out and stoning them, in death, physical death, is talking about spiritual death. Spiritual death. They're going to deserve the consequences of their decision to die in their sins. And the wages of sin is death. And so we have the teaching of, uh, to the church in Rome. And now we have Paul's teaching to the church in Corinth. 
if, if Rome was, was um, ungodly and pagan, um, you know, here's, here's number two, uh, close second, the city of Corinth. Do you not know that the unrighteousness will, the unrighteous, those who are living in what's not right, will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, don't be deceived, church. He's speaking to the church in Corinth. Neither fornicators, remember that, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Let me just define a couple of those. Neither fornicators, that's not the word pornea there, which we'll talk about in other sections. That's the word pornus in the Greek, and it specifically means male prostitute. Uh, the next one, nor homosexuals, that is those who submit themselves to homosexuals, nor sodomites, those are just, um, just basic male homosexuals, okay? But I don't want you to just only focus on that. We're going to come back to these verses, and we're going to look at the other things that are described there. But right now, what we're establishing is the biblical definition of homosexuality as a sin. Okay? I think we've established that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament now. The next thing that we want to do is we want to understand that we cannot say that we have fellowship with Jesus and practice homosexuality. We cannot do that. Why do I say that? Well, turn back in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Listen to what Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. So we have the word of truth speaking the truth. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who, what? does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name. And, and Jesus said, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Who is he speaking to? What does he say? You who practice lawlessness. You who practice. You say, Lord, Lord but you practice lawlessness. Now, practicing and falling are two different things. When you're involved in a sport and you want to get better at it, you want to continue uh, to do well at it, you go to what? Practice. When you fall, is that a positive thing? Are you trying, are you trying to do that? Are you trying? Is that, a, is that a choice? Is that something that you want to continue doing? Falling, falling, falling. The Bible is very clear between falling and practicing. Falling and practicing. And what you're going to find in, in all of these descriptions is those who are practicing, continuing to make the choice of perverting uh, what God's created and cre and and accomplishing and, and participating in iniquity, you who practice lawlessness. We can say, Lord, Lord, but if we practice lawlessness. In John chapter 8, verse 12, uh, Jesus speaking here, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not, what? Walk in darkness. Sin is darkness. Righteousness is light. We don't have time, but that's a very, very, very basic understanding found in the Bible. Jesus said, whoever follows me, you cannot walk in darkness, but have the light of, of life. And lastly, John, the author of 1 John also, he just, he said it this way. He said, if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, what do we do? We lie and we do not, what? Practice the truth. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to others. It's not the truth. 
because we're practicing lawlessness and we're not practicing the truth. So we cannot say that we have fellowship with Jesus and we actively participate and practice homosexual lifestyle. So those are the points that we wanted to define a sound doctrine regarding um, what is the truth uh, in um, the biblical responsibility and ordination of judges, the biblical definition of marriage, the biblical definition of homosexuality, and the biblical uh, definition of fellowship with God. So now, folks, what should be our response? Part two of the message now is what should be our response? Number one, I think we need to understand that the Bible told us that this was going to happen. Not only did the Bible tell us, but Jesus, if you want to go forward, Matthew, Mark, Luke, go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 22. Jesus speaking here. And he says to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. You will will say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, but you won't see it. And they will say to you, look here, look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as lightning um, that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be uh, in his days. But first he must suffer many things, be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of what? In the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. So the first clue that Jesus gave them was, it will be like in the days of Noah. Let me read to you what the Bible says. You don't need to turn there because we want to stay there. Um, I want to read to you in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 to 8, what it was like in the day of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creepy thing, bird of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8, very, very important, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what would save someone from the condemnation of choosing an ungodly lifestyle? Finding the grace of God. So he said, number one, Jesus said, it's going to be, it's going to get to the point where it'll be in the days of Noah. Verse 27, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Just write down Genesis chapter 19. You can read the story for yourself. But basically, do you know where Lot lived? He lived in, a, in kind of a, not the tri-city area, but the bi-city area. Uh, And what was uh, the name of those two cities? Sodom and Gomorrah. And what is the the, uh, term used for homosexuals in the Bible? Sodomites. It's where we got the, the name, the word, literally the word for homosexual was, was created in the days of Lot. And you can read chapter 19 about that. In in Jude, uh, verse uh, 7, it says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. And the New Testament confirms that that is exactly what those who practice those things can uh, anticipate. So we need to understand that the Bible told us that these things were going to happen. And folks, I, I you know, I, I'm not a prophet, um, but I will tell you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But be of good cheer. The Lord has overcome, and he will overcome, and all those who believe in him will overcome. 
So number two, we must acknowledge that homosexuality and same-sex marriage is sin. Our Christian response, if we call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ, we must believe what Christ said, who is the truth, of the truth, and we must, as Christians, define homosexuality and same-sex marriage as sin because the truth says it is. Number three, I think our Christian response is we cannot justify, and that means make right, homosexuality by the statement, we were born that way, thus justifying it and making it okay. Let me tell you, I agree with them. They were born that way, and so were you, and so was I, with a sinful nature. Anyone in here born without a desire to sin? We all have sinful nature. We all have a tendency to sin in a particular way. If you would like me, I could start naming some of yours. And my wife will name mine. (laughs) But it's true. We have to stop fighting on the wrong battlefield. They were born that way. That's not justification. That's the truth. And so was I. They were born with a sin nature. You, if you are practicing homosexuality, your loved ones practicing homosexuality, just like you were born with a sin nature, so were they. And it doesn't justify yours, and it doesn't justify theirs. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as... Through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. We all sin. That doesn't make homosexual homosexual immorality or same-sex marriage right, and nor does it make heterosexual immorality or any other sinful nature, stealing, lying, cheating, adultery, on and on and and on. The next thing I think our Christian response should be is we can judge homosexuality and the same-sex marriage as sin. We can. Do not fall for the out-of-context use of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Don't fall for it. Don't use it. And don't fall for it. You're in Luke. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7. What do I mean by that? Who in here has ever said, no, not ever said, I won't. Who in here has ever heard, well, you're not supposed to judge, you can't judge the Bible. Anybody ever heard anything like that from Christians about Christianity? The Bible says, it's completely out of context. Let me go, let's go. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge, and I want you to write the word crino there. Judge not that you be not judged. Write the word crino. For with what judgment, write the word crema. You judge, crino. You will be judged, crino. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And every single time the Bible says, judge not, every single time, and there's about five of them, it always in the, is in the context of crino and crema. Now, what am I talking about? Crino means to separate between what's right and what's wrong. Sheep, goats. Separate not that you not be separated for with what crema, that's condemnation. You separate with, you will be separated with. If you're going to use sin to condemn a particular sin, then your sin will be used against you to condemn you. The same way you dish it out, you're going to receive it. 
So every single time when the Bible says, do not judge, please help people remember or teach them, it means do not condemn to hell. That's not your job. It's not my job. Well, can we judge? Show me, show me when we can judge. Well, look at Matthew chapter uh, 7, verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. The topic is false prophets. You will know them by their what? You'll be able to crino them by their what? You'll be able to separate a false prophet from a true prophet by their what? Fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Good tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and throw away, thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you will what? Crino. You will know right from wrong, bad from good. And then uh, let me just share this. Jesus, again, speaking the word of truth, speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Yeah, I missed. Um, John 7, 24 says, do not judge according to appearance, but what? Judge with what? A righteous judgment. Are we to judge? Yes, we are. The word there is crino. Are we to separate with righteousness? Yes, we are. Are we to condemn or damn someone? No, we're not. Christian, hear that. Those of you who have family members, those of you who practice homosexuality, hear what we said. We will determine that it is wrong, that it is sin based on the word of God, which is truth. But you will never, I pray, hear a message of condemnation upon you from this pulpit or from the people in this church. That condemnation will come by your own choice to reject the forgiveness of sin. The next response is we can disagree and not be prejudiced, haters, and condemners. We can say that it's wrong and unjustly be accused of hating. Can we disagree and not hate someone? Absolutely. Jesus in John chapter 8, if you want to go there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 8, it's the story of the adulterous woman. Can we agree that adultery is wrong? You okay with that one? Okay. So she's caught in the very act They bring her, and in John chapter 10, chapter 8, excuse me, John chapter 8, verse 10, thanks. I have it up on the screen also. It says, when Jesus had raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those, what? Accusers of yours. Has no one, what? Condemned you. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, listen to the two-part answer. Neither do I condemn you. Go and what? Sin no more. That needs to be our response. A response of love. I just want to read to you very quickly Um, Galatians chapter 5, which is one of those sections in in the Bible uh, that describe a a list of ungodly practices that will keep us from inheriting heaven. In Galatians chapter 5, and looking at um, verse 19... It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and that literally means shamelessness, 
idolatry, sorcery. The word there is pharmakia. It means those controlled by um, drugs and Satan being uh, the author of uh, that uh, power over uh, those people's lives. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 6 is basically the same uh, idea and, and very much included very strongly because of um, that was the preeminent of of the, the, not the preeminent, but it was, it was epic in Corinth. And so there was fornicator, pronos, there was homosexual, those submitting to homosexual, sodomites, but there were also thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers. Anyone in here ever coveted? Can you just raise your hand? Just be honest. Yeah, I've, I've coveted. You're in that list, and so am I. So with the same condemnation you use for someone who does something else in that list, you and I will be judged with that same condemnation. That, that pretty much should do this to our lips huh? of condemnation. Does that do this to our lips about judging righteousness, righteously? No, it does not. And you could do the same thing with Ephesians chapter 5 or Revelation 21.8. They're in my notes. Uh, number seven is we can and we should love them. We will and we do love you. If you're in this room, we can and we do love your family members. There's people who uh, have attended here um, who are practicing homosexuals. There are family that are in this room now that bring their family members to this church. Uh, who are practicing homosexual, homosexuals, we invite them to come. And when we rightly divide the word of God, if we happen to be on that topic that day, we will rightly divide the word of God and share that truth in love. We get often asked, are they, quit talking like they're not in the room. You are, and yes, they are welcome here. They are invited here. I thank God that someone spoke the truth into my life because I thought what was right was wrong and what was wrong was right. And let me give you some motivation. At the end of that list of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, and such were some of you. Who was, who was in that? Anybody in here? Were you in that list of, of 1 Corinthians 6? Yeah. And how about... Um, Ephesians chapter 5, for you were once darkness. Is that, can anybody say yes, I was? And light came into our lives. We can and do welcome them into this church. We can and do welcome you into this church, into our lives. And we promise to love you and to care about you and to share the love of God with you and your family and your friends and your neighbors because that's what God did for us. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. Our, our vision verses for this church, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, 16, it tells us to speak the truth in love. At the end of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, And a servant of the Lord must not, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, and able to teach and be patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Folks, the reason why we need to acknowledge it is sin, because if we don't, 
those people practicing those things and all the other sins will die in their sins. They will die in their sins. Jesus said in eight, chapter 8, verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Thanks for coming, you guys. God bless you. They have a place that they need to be at when I was supposed to stop five minutes ago. God bless you. We love having you guys with us. And so, let's finish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from their sin. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. God, thank you for loving me when I was your enemy. Thank you for loving me when I, I don't know if I hated you or hated what, I don't know. But Lord, I pray that um, we would be known as people who love people and not hate, people who will rightly divide the word of God and share the truth in love and not the truth in condemnation. Lord, I pray if there is anyone here practicing the sin of homosexuality or same-sex marriage or supporting those who do, I pray that they would confess their sin just as I need to confess my sin. And Lord, that they would ask for for the forgiveness of their sin, as we must ask for the forgiveness of our sin. That we may find the true love that we're looking for. And Lord, that you would give us power over those sinful tendencies. Mine are different than theirs, but the same and just as powerful. But you have overcome sin and death in my life and you can in theirs. If you're here today, maybe it's not the sin of homosexuality, but you are controlled by sin in your life and you've never asked for forgiveness. You've never been set free. We sang a song that says that the name of Jesus can break every chain. You've tried to break that chain over and over and you've always, 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 you thought you were free and you were running and bam. It was there again. Right now, God wants to forgive you of your sin, but you have to ask for that forgiveness. If there's anyone here and you, for any sin whatsoever, you've never asked God to forgive you and to come in your life and be the Lord of your life. The Bible says, if you call out on his name, you'll be saved. And I want to lead you in that prayer. Just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me today. I want to be forgiven. I want to be made right with God. I want to be set free. Is there anybody at all that say, yes, please lead me in that prayer I know that God wants to set me free. I know he loves me. I thought the church was just a big condemnation organization. Today I've heard the word of God. I've heard God's word. And I want to accept God. Is there anybody here for the first time in your life you said, yeah, I want to pray. Lord, at Outward Sign, we uh, acknowledge that we're either rejecting you or we have received you. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak into our lives. And I pray now, Lord, that we would go forth equipped for the work of the ministry and we would go forth speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love for your glory and others and our good. In Jesus' name, amen.